one afternoon when I was in college and home for fall break, I was hanging out with my older brother who was in the Marine Corps at the time and he was working at Quantico teaching officers how to shoot. And so he took me down to the base to go through a small training course with him and hang out. And when it was over, we hopped on 95 North to head back home. We spent the majority of time of the drive talking about life, kind of catching each other up. I shared some stories about college. He told me stories about my nephews. But in the middle of one of the stories, he just stopped talking. And so I waited for him for like a minute or two for him to finish his thought, but he was completely focused on something else. He was focused on his rear view mirror. As I tried to figure out what was going on, he ended up crushing his gas pedal and he swerved into the right lane as quickly as possible. And so I began to freak out because I'm like, we're leaving Quantico. Like, don't weird things happen there? Like, is, am I important? Are they chasing me? Probably not. He might be, who knows? And so I'm trying to figure out like, what is going on? Like, why is he driving so fast? Why is he getting over into the right lane? And so I began to freak out a little bit. And then he told me to look to my left. And so I turned to look out the left side of the window and I saw a small sedan zoom past us, easily going 100 miles per hour. As it got past us in the left lane, the driver began to lose control and the car started to shake from side to side, started to get the wobbles. And the car took a hard left turn toward the median and oncoming traffic on the other side of 95. Thankfully, there was a set of guardrails there in the median and the car slammed into them. Somehow the car was still able to drive though and actually swerved right across three lanes of traffic right in front of us, barely missing my brother's car before it drived off the right hand side of the road and into a ditch. But what happened was the car was actually going so fast that the ditch didn't stop them. It became a ramp. And the car ended up going down into this ditch and flew 15 feet up in the air as it flipped over into the grass about 30 feet beyond the highway. It was like a scene from a movie. At this point, everybody who saw it had stopped on the side of the road, including me and my brother. Our adrenaline was pumping. There was this moment where we were like happy to be alive because we knew that that car would have crushed us. And as we stood on the side of the highway, we watched as four people crawled out of an upside down car completely okay. It was nuts. As we drove home that day, uh, our hearts were still pounding. We just kept talking about it. I kept asking him like, what did you see behind you? How did you know it was coming? You know, we kept talking about this moment. But here's one of the things that we talked about later. What would have happened if the guardrail hadn't been in the median? What would have happened if the car going 100 miles per hour was able to drive right through the median and into oncoming traffic? How much worse could it have been? I mean, clearly the car was totaled. It was upside down 30 feet uh, off to the side of the road. But the guys walked away from the accident seemingly unharmed. Right? It could have been so much worse. And that's the picture, and that's really what this series is all about. Today we're starting a brand new series called Guardrails. And I'm gonna let you know up front that this series was originally written by a guy named Andy Stanley. And a few years ago, I was working on a preaching team at one of our supporting churches, and I helped them rewrite this and kind of edit this series for their church. And so when I got to hear it and experience it and be on the writing side of it, I realized that it was so good that at some point we wanted to do it at Collective. And so I already know that this is going to be a good series because Andy Stanley is an incredible pastor and he wrote it. And then I worked with another team that's just equally great to rewrite it. And then I took both of those and reworked them and made a series that's perfect for this church. When I say series, uh, we do different kinds of series here at Collective. They usually last between three and eight weeks and they're all focused on one big idea. Some series are based on a person, like the sermon series we just came out of was based on the life of David. Some series, we take a section of the Bible and we see what we can learn over a few weeks. That's actually the type of series we're doing next. Once we get through Garderos, we're doing a series uh, based off of a book called Habakkuk, called Hope in the Dark. We do a finance series every year. We do a relationship series every year. We always do a series that's from the biographies of Jesus. But one thing I try to do every year is a sermon that's based off of wisdom. Wisdom series end up being very practical in nature. They typically uh, do not uh, delve into the deep-rooted issues like dealing with your past, although they will apply to that. They're not focused on the deep end of the theological pool, although they are rooted there. And wisdom series aren't overly emotional, so you probably won't cry during the sermons in this series, although they will help you become emotionally healthy. Now, a lot of the Bible is what scholars call wisdom literature. In fact, when you break it down, the Bible isn't one book. The Bible is a collection of 66 books. The word Bible actually means library. And so 66 different books make up the Bible. Some of those are history. Some of those are letters that were actually written to the church that tell the church, this is how you should function. This is how you should move forward. And a bunch of the books in the Bible are actually called wisdom. And in fact, 25% of the entire Bible is considered wisdom literature. 
And so a couple of things up front as we start this series today that are important to know. Uh, the first is this, guardrails are barriers that keep you safe. If you hit a guardrail with your car, that is bad. Some of you know that firsthand. It will cause damage to your car, you'll have to have work done. But if you hadn't hit the guardrail, if the guardrail hadn't been there, something a lot worse could have happened. So we put guardrails up to protect people, protect them from going into oncoming traffic, protect them from driving off the road. The second thing is this, guardrails are placed in the safe zone. We don't put guardrails over the edge of a cliff because they wouldn't work. We don't put guardrails right on the edge of the cliff because people would hit them and they'd flip over, fall over, there'd be more damage. We put guardrails a few feet away from the edge of the cliff so that if people hit them, they're still safe. Guardrails in the danger zone are useless because it's too late. Guardrails in the safe zone protect us from the worst case scenario. The third thing is this, guardrails are designed to minimize damage. Going back to the accident I talked about earlier, the car had some major damage, but if the guardrail wasn't there, imagine the destruction that would have happened to the car if it collided with oncoming traffic, right? So like it was beat down, it was broken, they definitely couldn't drive it again, but what else could have happened to the cars, but more importantly to the people on the other side of the road? But instead they drilled a guardrail at 100 miles per hour and somehow were able to keep driving. The people inside were safe. That's what guardrails are designed to do. The guardrails minimize the damage in that instance. So here's the thing. If there's one thing that you can take home today, it's this, and this is really important. Jesus died for you. You didn't deserve it. He will forgive you. He will give you a second chance and then another second chance and then another, and that's freedom. And we can take that forgiveness for ourselves, but we also have the opportunity to offer that to other people because we've been set free. So we can then give that and offer that and show that to other people. Jesus wants to give you true life. So it's great to get forgiveness. It's great to get second chances. But what if we could learn to live in such a way that we didn't crash our lives in the first place? We're never going to be perfect. So the series isn't about figuring out ways to be a perfect person. We're never going to outgrow our need for grace. But if we are following Jesus and doing what he teaches, we are going to crash less often. So I'm so thankful for the fact that Jesus offers endless second chances because I know I personally need them. I would much rather live my life so that I don't have to constantly take him up on that offer. And I'm convinced that if we put guardrails in our lives relationally and spiritually, in your dating, in your marriage, you will have a better life. You will make less mistakes. You will be happier. You will have a greater purpose. You will have more fulfilling relationships if you have scriptural guardrails. And so the goal of this series is to talk about that idea and to help us all live wisely. This series is for the person who sees other people mess up their lives and doesn't want to mess up their own, but they don't really know where to start. This series is for the person who wants to stop, but they aren't sure how. This series is for the person who wants to grow in any area, but every time they try, they fail. And so that's what we're gonna focus on over the next few weeks. And here is the Bible verse that this whole entire series is based on in Ephesians 5. It says this, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. And that's a really basic statement, right? Like anybody in here can read that and kind of understand what he's talking about. Be careful how you live. Don't be foolish, live wise. Like have wisdom in the decisions that you make. But what's really important about what Paul the writer says here is he actually starts Ephesians 5, 15 with this word, so. And if you're ever reading the Bible and say, you know, you see it online or you get like the Bible verse sent to you uh, of a day, if you're ever doing that and you see a verse that starts with the word so, what you need to do is look back. Because what that writer is doing is saying, hey, I'm referencing something that I said earlier. So that's what Paul's doing. He's actually saying, hey, I'm referencing something I talked about earlier. So that's what we're going to look at. So this is what Paul says before Ephesians 5.15. He says, so live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Now, all of that is pretty straightforward as well. If you are a follower of Jesus, that sounds great. Live as people of light, take no part in evil deeds. Got it. But we have a problem. How do I figure that out? How do I figure out what is evil? How do I figure out what pleases the Lord? Because I want to do that, and I've tried to do that, but I haven't gotten it right before. And some things are obvious. Baseball season's underway, and it's very clear that the Orioles are gonna be absolute trash this year. 
And so you have a choice if you are an Orioles fan. Do you stick it out and keep rooting for them? Or do you jump ship and start rooting for certain teams in New York or Boston who've literally sold their souls for money to pay for championships? I also heard they kick puppies. They're terrible. But the choice there is pretty simple, right? You stick it out so that you aren't a traitor. Okay, just need you to know that. If you're an Orioles fan, stick it out. We'll win a World Series in like 60 years. We'll get there. That's an easy decision. <laughs> it's not. They're terrible. But how do we figure out what pleases the Lord and what is evil? And the answer to that is actually a question. And the question is this. What is the wise thing to do? What is the wise thing to do? And the thing is, we have a tendency to ask the wrong question. If you're a Christian, you might ask it like this, is it sinful? But the reality is that there are some things in relationships that are not sinful, but they're definitely not wise. Now, whether you're a Christian or not, a question you might ask is, is it wrong? But then you have to wonder, well, says who? There are a lot of questions where I wonder, is it wrong? But I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what is wrong in every situation in my life, but I do know whether or not it is wise. Is it wrong for you to talk to an attractive coworker? I don't know. But based on how it messes with your marriage, I know that it's not wise. Is it wrong for you to stay up late and surf the internet? Probably not. But based on what you search for, it's not wise. Is it sinful to use social media all the time? I doubt it. But based on the fact that it makes you feel lonely, it's not wise. And I can keep going, and so could you. There are things in your life where you know it might not be wrong, but it's not wise. Most of the problems in your life are because we don't ask that question, right? Most of the problems in our life come because we ask the question of, is it wrong? Does it feel good? What's my right? But you didn't ask, what is the wise thing to do? And what's really important about this question is it's contextual. I have a friend of mine who can't drink, like ever, for the rest of his life, not even a sip. He's been sober for about 10 years now. And he's done a great job. He has accountability. He's in groups, all that kind of stuff. But he knows that he can never drink again, and he's proven that. So one way we ask this question is, in light of my past experience, what is the wise thing to do? Because there are things that you can do that I can't do, because in light of my past experience, it's not a wise thing for me. And there are things that I can do that you can't do, because in light of your past experience, it's not the wise thing for you. And we all get this when it comes to addiction. If we, if we have people in our life who struggle with addiction, we understand this. You totally get this principle. You know that the person you care about cannot go there. They cannot do that. They cannot be around them ever again under any circumstances. Even though there are other people in your life who can go there, who can do that, who can be around them, no problem. My friend does not drink and avoid situations where alcohol is involved because it will drag him down. It will hurt him. And ultimately, it will hurt the people around him. And we get that. And the people in his life encourage him to avoid that. And so here's what I'm saying. The guardrails we so diligently and accurately apply to the life of an addict in the area of addiction, we need to apply to ourselves. And we do that by asking, in light of my past experience, what is the wise thing to do? Another way we ask it is this. In light of my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? Now, here's an example. There are a ton of people who go to this church who do jobs that need a security clearance. Raise your hand if you don't do that. Don't raise your hand. No, stop. If you, have, if you have a security clearance and you raised your hand, you probably shouldn't have a security clearance. But there are people in this church that are students. There are people in this church who are working toward those types of jobs. But if you want a job like that one day, there are certain things that you cannot do now because you will become disqualified. In fact, a few years ago, my wife told me that a woman from the FBI came in to talk to the students in her middle school. And the agent was actually talking about security clearances and being qualified for the job. And she shared this with eighth graders. Those are 13 year olds. And she explained that there are certain decisions that if they made them now, they would never get a job in the FBI. And so she told them if they want a job like hers, they needed to start thinking about those decisions right now, 13 year olds. And what she was telling them is she was telling them to ask the question, in light of my future hopes and dreams, what is the wise thing to do? And ultimately, all we're doing is rephrasing Ephesians 5.15 as a question, right? It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. So we ask the question, what is the wise thing to do? And the answer for this series when we ask the question, what is the wise thing to do, is the wise thing to do is set up guardrails in different areas of our lives. And Paul actually continues to talk about this in Ephesians 5 as it continues. This is what he wrote. He says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Now that phrase, make the most of every opportunity, literally means redeem the time. It means redeem the time. Don't waste time. Use every moment to your benefit. Use the time you have wisely. And it continues to say the phrase evil days. And this is very important as well. 
There is evil all around you. There are spiritual forces of evil. There are people who are following evil. There are things trying to trap you and trip you and make you fall. And so you need to be able to navigate an evil world with wisdom. And so that's why Paul writes, and he continues, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Again, he's really trying to drive this home. Don't just float through life, making it up as you go along. Don't fit into what culture says. Don't succumb to evil. Instead, do what God wants. Do the wise thing. And then Paul, as he continues to write this, he actually takes a really quick turn. And in verse 18, he gets super specific. We're going to read it in a second. But here's why I think he does this. I think he is thinking, I've given them the big idea, right? He's given them the big idea, and he wants to make it practical. Because he keeps saying, do what the Lord says. Live in the light. Avoid deeds of darkness, which are all pretty big thoughts, right? They aren't super practical when you try to get it down to the pieces and the foundation of it. So what Paul does in Ephesians 5.18 is he makes it practical. He makes it super specific. He says this, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Now that is very specific. I know some of you right now are like, he said wine, not beer. I'm good to go. But it's almost odd that he chooses this one thing, right? It almost feels personal or like a soapbox, like the night before one of his friends got super drunk and did something stupid. But what's Paul doing here? He's setting up a guardrail. Paul's saying that he wants to give you an example of how to live wisely, so he's setting up a guardrail. And he's setting up a guardrail about getting drunk. And listen to me, Paul isn't saying don't drink, right? Paul isn't opposed to drinking. The idea of drinking isn't a sin. Some of you might have been taught that, or you've been told that, or you've lived that whole way your entire life. If that's a tension for you, come find me after service, we'll talk about it. But what Paul is saying is don't get drunk, and that's really important. And, and listen to this. Uh, this is my opinion, but this is what I think. I think getting drunk in and of itself probably isn't that big of a deal. But what happens on the other side of drunk, right? What happens on the other side when you go too far? You probably know someone who has an STD because of getting drunk. You might know someone who is a single mom, dad's completely out of the picture because of a night of too many drinks turned into a random hookup. You probably know someone who has a criminal record because they got drunk, hopped in a car, got drunk, got in a fight, got drunk and put themselves in a place they shouldn't be in. And I hope this isn't true, but in a room like this, it's guaranteed. Some of you know someone who isn't alive anymore because someone else decided to get drunk. You see, when, when people get drunk, the majority of the time, nothing bad happens. But Paul is saying that when you get drunk, there's a small chance of you doing something that will wreck your life, that will dramatically change your life or impact someone else's life forever. There's a small chance of you doing something that you will feel the impact of every single day for the rest of your life. And so what he is saying is that we should set up a guardrail before we ever get to that place. He's saying, don't even do it. And here's a deep statement, so deep, we'll put it on the screen for you. If you don't get drunk, you can't make a mistake that is a result of getting drunk. Super deep, right? Life-changing. But that's real. And see, the scripture and other scriptures like it say to set a guardrail when it comes to how much you drink, because on the other side of drunk is bad news. Now, I know a lot of you grew up in a church where you probably heard, don't get drunk, because it's a sin. And that's true, that's out of alignment with what God wants for us. But the reality is it's so much deeper than that. Paul's saying don't get drunk because it's not wise. We don't wanna live like fools, we wanna live like people who are wise, so we set up a guardrail. Now here's the problem that we have. Culture does not like guardrails. Culture hates guardrails. About a year ago, Mike Pence got in the news for having a guardrail, and something came out that was called the Mike Pence Rule which before Mike Pence was actually called the Billy Graham rule because about 40, 50 years ago, he actually instituted it in his life and in his ministry. But the press caught wind of something the vice president said 16 years ago about his relationship with his wife. He said to protect his marriage, he will never have lunch alone with another woman. He said to protect his marriage, he also won't be alone with another woman other than his wife in a private setting. And when the press found this out and heard this, they went crazy. New York Times, New Yorker, the Atlantic Guardian, Vogue, which is super weird, the Washington Post, they all bashed his personal rule. They said that the rule was old fashioned. They said that the rule was sexist. They said that the rule was everything that is wrong with religion. And one concern those articles brought up, which is very valid and does need to be addressed, is that you, and specifically I'm talking to men in this instant, men, you must create environments where women are heard and where women can be mentored. Because if men continue to create systems where men automatically have the upper hand of promotion or development or advancement, that is wrong, that's sexist. But for me personally, I follow 
the Billy Graham rule. I have another name for it, but that's what it is. I've followed it my entire marriage. I've followed it from the moment I got into ministry. I require our staff to follow it. A married person on our staff cannot be alone with a person of the opposite sex in a private setting. So when I meet one-on-one with my staff, which we do every single week, it's in our office, and we meet in the public meeting room where the rest of everybody else is just a few feet away. Sometimes it gets awkward. Sometimes it's hard because you want to talk about serious topics, but we do that to protect ourselves. If I meet with someone in public, I have them meet me at the Minoxi Starbucks, and I'll grab a table as close to the counter as possible because the baristas there know me. They know my name. They know what I do for a living. It puts me in a place where people can always see what I am doing and hear what I am saying. I even have a camera in my office that sends alerts to my wife so that when I'm in there, if I'm alone, if anyone enters, she knows. And those are some of my own personal guardrails. But here's why I do this. The data says that 20% of American married people have had an affair. And affairs don't start with two strangers walking up to each other and saying, hey, do you want to have sex right now? Most affairs, and the data proves, start with two people spending a lot of time together two people connecting, two people sharing private moments, and it goes on from there. And here's the thing, I've sat down and talked with dozens of people who have told me about the day that it happened. I'm not even talking about a day that someone else had an affair, I'm talking about the day their parents did. The day that mom sat them down and told them dad wasn't coming home, he was going to live with someone else. It was the day that mom confessed what she had been doing. And it's ripped the marriages apart, it's ripped families apart, and that day changed their life forever. And most of the people that I've talked to would give anything to go back in time and enforce this type of rule on their parents. Now listen, do I think I'm gonna drive my marriage off a cliff? No. But some of those 20% didn't think so either. Some of the people in my life didn't think so either. And, I, if, I, and if I have the right guardrails in place, I know that I don't even need to worry about the 20%. And listen, I get that Mike Pence is a political figure and you have opinions about that. That is not what this is about at all. What I'm talking about is a guardrail that he set up, a personal guardrail that he had to protect his marriage, a guardrail that he set up to protect his family. But the reality is culture doesn't like guardrails. I'll give you a few more examples. Culture says to tell teenagers, don't have sex until you're ready. So when scripture says to keep the marriage bed pure, culture will respond, that's old fashioned, that sex isn't a big deal. Culture says debt is great. So when scripture says the borrower is slave to the lender, culture says, well, debt is a tool, use it, do whatever you can to reach the American dream. And all of that to say, just know that if you choose to live out scripture and create guardrails, guardrails culture will mock you. If you put guardrails in your sex life, if you put guardrails in your finances, if you put guardrails in your marriage, if you put guardrails in your social media usage, if you put guardrails in any aspect of your life, culture will laugh at you. They will judge you. They will say that you're old fashioned or out of touch. Culture will say that you're weak or uncool or missing out on what the world has to offer. Now, just to make sure that we're seeing the big picture of what we're talking about today, there are two things that we need to know about guardrails for our own lives. The first is that guardrails are wise. This means that guardrails are not legalistic. There's a big difference. There are multiple examples in scripture of people being legalistic. In fact, this happens to Jesus all the time in the Bible when Jesus works on the mandated day off called the Sabbath. It was a day that was designated for rest. And so what happens is multiple times Jesus actually on that Sabbath, on that day off, will heal somebody, like literally change their life forever. It's a great miracle of God, but the religious lawyers attack him and criticize him for working on the Sabbath, that's legalism. They completely miss what honors God on the Sabbath, which is honoring God. And so we rightly revolt against empty legalism. And the difference between a legalistic rule and a healthy guardrail is this. A legalistic rule is about arrogance. A healthy guardrail is about safety. A legalistic rule is there so people can arrogantly feel better about themselves because they can keep a rule that you can't. While a healthy guardrail is there because if I don't have it, I may crash and burn. Another way you can say it is this, legalism is about arrogance, guardrails are about humility. Legalism is about I am better than you because I can keep that rule. Guardrails are about I guess I'm worse than you because I need that rule that doesn't apply to you. The second thing is this, guardrails are personal. Have you ever found yourself saying that an entire group should never, right? Married people should never fill in the blank, teenagers should never, singles should never, teachers should never, and you just kind of say something. When you make a statement like that, what you're doing is you are taking a guardrail that is personal for you 
and saying that it applies at all times and all places to everyone in that situation. But guardrails have to be personal. A few years ago, Ray and I went through a church planter's assessment to make sure that we were fit to plant a church. We were, that's why we were here. If we weren't and were here, that'd be very terrifying. But before we ever went on this assessment, we had to actually fill out a bunch of information about our family. We had to fill out a family tree. We had to go back a few generations. We had to answer a bunch of questions. And so the first night we were there, we sat down with a counselor to talk about it. And one of the first things that the counselor told me was that I am genetically predisposed to addiction because of my family heritage. We have multiple people in our family and multiple people in our extended family that struggle with addiction. And because of that, it's genetic. I have a predisposition for that. And then we spent time talking about guardrails that Ray and I needed to put up so I don't allow addiction of any kind to creep into my life. The reason why I put boundaries on our staff is because when I was in high school, my mentor cheated on his wife with a woman in the church. And it all started with them spending time one-on-one together working on projects alone. Do I think I'll do the same thing? Absolutely not. But I've seen it happen, so I'm going to do the wise thing in my own life and put up guardrails. And the reality is you need to do the same thing. But the guardrails that work for me might not be the ones that work for you. That's why in this series, I'm going to offer up suggestions, but you won't hear me telling you which ones you need. They're personal, they're for you, and you need to figure that out. You need to figure out how to put guardrails into your life and into your relationships, into your social life, into your marriage. But ultimately, that decision is yours and yours alone. Now, Paul, he actually finishes the scripture in Ephesians 5 by tying this into an even bigger picture of what God wants to do in your life. And I love this. Ephesians 5.18, we read the beginning, but this is what it says. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. The goal is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's what that means. When you give your life to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are, and I trust your promises, so I'm going to follow you, his spirit will come and live inside of you. And it's called the spirit of God or the Holy Spirit, and he promises it will guide you. It's it's a helper is another word for it. And so catch this. We said that guardrails are personal. The Holy Spirit is your personal connection to God. So listening to the Holy Spirit is how you create guardrails. The Holy Spirit convicts you. It leads you into setting up guardrails so you can experience a better life by following God. And this is why you need the Holy Spirit. So when you read scripture, you hear stories, the Holy Spirit points out, here's, what you, here's where you need a guardrail. Put a guardrail here. And in doing so, you will live the life that God wants you to live, the life that you are actually designed for. That's what it means to follow the Holy Spirit. If you are somebody who wants God's Spirit to lead you, instead of just trying to make up your own guardrails, because you know at some point you'll end up in that ditch, you do that by putting your faith in Jesus and getting baptized. And as a church, we want to help you think through that. We want to help talk, uh, talk with you about that. We want to help you take that step. You can check off the baptism box in your connection card so we can talk about it or come find me in the lobby. Later on today during the service, we're actually celebrating as Gabby takes that step. That's why the trough is set up. We're watching someone take that step to pursue faith, to take that step to figure out, okay, God, how do you need to lead my life? The last thing I want to point out and what Paul says is the word instead. Paul says that we can live foolishly or we can ruin our li- and ruin our lives or be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying in, in 518 is he's saying we have a choice, that you personally have a choice. You on your own can lead your life. You on your, loan, on your own can make your own rules to set your own guardrails, and the results of that will be that you ruin your life. He says, but that isn't the only option. The other option is that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says it's your choice, but you can't have both. It's one or the other, meaning if you trust yourself, you most likely will end up in a ditch. And the reality is some of you might feel like you're there right now. And the reason why that happens, and we've all felt that way, and some of us are in that place right now. Some of us have been out of that place. But the reason why that happens is because we sin, because we fall short, because we reject God. To be honest, a big piece of it is because we're arrogant. We think that we should be the savior and the leader of our own lives. But for a lot of us, we would say it was in that ditch that we realized that we needed Jesus because we can't get ourselves out of the ditch. And Jesus died on the cross to pull us from that ditch. And he says, I will make you new. He says, I will wash you clean. He says, I will lift you up and give you new life. So the word instead here is saying, you can ruin your life if you choose to lead it on your own, or you can live how God wants. And the difference is guardrails. The difference is asking the question, what is the wise thing to do? On the day that my brother and I witnessed that car flip over, I seriously doubt the driver woke up that day thinking, I feel like an accident's coming on. Right, I seriously doubt that he woke up that day thinking, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna run to a guardrail, I'm gonna flip my car over and hope that everybody is okay. 
No one who has ever been in an accident, and maybe you are one of those people, no one who has ever been in an accident in the history of the world has ever thought, I'm gonna wake up today and get in a car accident. That's what I want to do. Because people don't cause accidents because they plan to. People cause accidents because they don't plan not to. And listen, God wants to forgive you. God will always forgive you, and that's grace. And if there's one thing you take home today, take that. But he also wants to help you stay on the road. So for the next few weeks, we're gonna ask, what is the wise thing to do? And the wise thing to do is going to be to set up some guardrails. And as we listen to God's spirit, and as he speaks to us through scripture, we can learn how to live the life that God truly wants us to live. A life that's full of hope, a life that's full of purpose, a life that has better relationships, a life that has freedom, and a life that has grace. And maybe, maybe through him, we will all crash a little bit less often. Let's pray. God, um, thank you that, uh, that we have examples of how to live our life. Because God, when, when we, we do it on our own or when we try to create our own rules, our own guardrails, or ultimately, God, when we ask ourselves, um, what do I want to do or how do I feel, um, we end up in a ditch. We end up crashing into a guardrail, flipping upside down. God, sometimes we walk away with bruises and scratches, but sometimes it doesn't work that way. So God, I just pray as we wrestle with this idea of what is the wise thing to do um, in our relationships, in our marriage, in our career, with our finances, whatever it may be, God, I hope you, I hope you provide us with that wisdom. God, help us see it in scripture. Help us see it uh, with the people that are in our life that are trying to help us and lead us in the right direction. Uh, God, help us figure this out. God, ultimately we pray uh, that you continue to offer us grace. Because God, as we try to set up these guardrails, as we try to put them in our marriage and put them in our life, we're gonna mess up. We're gonna fall short, we're gonna put him in the wrong place. Um, but God, ultimately, uh, I pray that everybody here knows that there is grace to get another chance and another chance and another chance so that we can finally figure out how to do it right the way that you want us to. God, give us wisdom. Help us uh, figure out how to have the best relationships, um, the best marriages, the best job, uh, the best purpose we could have, and ultimately the best relationship with you. God, we love you and pray these things in your name, amen.